one of the things that, that believers oftentimes struggle with is the subject of prayer. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, we get that, okay, prayer is talking to God. It's a relatively simple thing. But maybe you found yourself in the place where you're, you're dedicated to a time of prayer, but you find it maybe getting repetitious. Or, or maybe you find yourself even bored in your, in your prayer time. It's like, well, I'm, I pray and I believe in the Lord. I love Jesus, but my prayer time is just the same as it was. What I'm praying about today is the exact same thing, maybe even in the exact same way that I prayed it yesterday and the day before. And, and I believe that, that prayer time is something that not only are we reaching the Lord through prayer and petition as he tells us to do, but it's one of those things that can energize us for our day. It, it creates that, that spark in us. Um, and the Lord ministers to us as we pray to him. And so this series, I'm going to give you some very practical things that, that we instill in our lives and, and some very practical tools and structure, if you want to call it that, for prayer that we can use to better engage our mind as we pray and as we seek the Lord and just some powerful things. So, so you know, be awake, be alert, um, and, and be ready uh, for what we're talking about today and over these next several weeks. So a lot of buildup. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this day. Now, Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts. Make us ready to receive everything, every drop that you have for us today. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Give us that heart to receive and understand. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. We're going to start in verses 10 through 13. We're going to um, hold for a minute, and then we'll read the rest of those verses. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. So last week, we really focused on verse 12 of those verses, and, and we talked about this whole idea of the unseen. We talked about angels and Satan and, and demons, and we said that part of living as a follower of Jesus is living with the understanding and belief that there really is an unseen realm where things are transpiring and warfare is happening, but we just can't see it. And that's foundational to the faith. The understanding that there's a spiritual reality that exists and there is a battle going on that we don't see and most of the time we, we can't fully understand, but the Bible makes very clear is there and that warfare is happening. Well, hold on. The problem is, if you know anything about warfare, and we already said we know we're, we're a military town and a military, you know, connected people here. How do you win a battle against an enemy that you can't see? That's nearly impossible. One of the things that makes the United States military so overpowering and just destructive in nature, which is the role of the military, is the fact that we can now wage warfare when people don't even know that we're there. Drone strikes, they are just part of the battlefield now. Uh, fifth generation fighter jets, things like the F-22 and the f 35, do you know that they don't even really have to be in the area to take out enemy airplanes at this point? They, some other enemy is flying around in, in, a, in a MiG-18 or something old school like that, and we will fire missiles from so far away. They had no idea we were even in the area. They're flying around. Next thing you know, here comes a missile. What's happened? Our ground forces are so destructive. You think about the, the Navy SEALs and Delta Force and any Marine. We can wage... <laughs> We can wage warfare in the nighttime in ways that, that nobody else can. We can. Because of night vision and thermal, we just have the ability to do things that, that no one else can do. Nighttime is, is a difficult time for other folks to get around. I don't know about you. I have trouble making it from my bed to the bathroom in the middle of the night when it's dark because I, can't, I might get injured on the way there. So the unseen can be difficult. How do you win a battle against an enemy that you can't see? Paul says, the Bible says, here's how you do it. 
You need strength, you need armor, you need weaponry that only God can provide. We may have said a couple of weeks ago, too often Christians try to fight spiritual battles with natural strength and then wonder, why do I keep losing? Why do I keep falling? Well, Paul says, look, in this kind of battle, you can't do it on your own. You need God's strength. You need God's armor to help you make it through. So let's pick up in verse 14 where it says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And so Paul is painting a picture there of a soldier, a Roman soldier in this case, getting ready for battle. And he's using this visual imagery to to convey spiritual principles. Each piece of the armor here is, is something that only God can provide. All of the pieces of the armor belong to and come from God. If you hear me on that, say amen. And so starting today and over the next several weeks, we're just going to go through the the pieces of the armor one at a time. And we're starting today with the belt of truth. And so verse 14 said, stand firm, the first part said, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. I don't know about you, but when I think about warfare and I think about armor and stuff like that, I I think about some of those those more glorious kind of pieces. You think about the helmet, think about the breastplate, you get a sword and a shield. Paul starts with the belt. And we might think, why even include that, right? You think about armor, I'm not even thinking about the belt. Well, the belt, believe it or not, is actually one of the most important parts, and he starts there for a reason. Right, and it, when we think about a belt, we're just thinking about something that might hold our pants up if necessary, uh, or, or something we're trying to make a little fashion statement with it. You know, uh, we're in Texas. You might have a big belt buckle that uh, you might have worn to church today, for all I know. But in Roman combat gear, the belt is a tremendously important piece, and it's not just for show. The breastplate would attach to the belt. The 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 sword and the sheath would attach to the belt, and so that would be maybe the first thing that the soldier would put on because it, it's going to be hard to, to, to put up. You're certainly not going to put your helmet on first and then go put your, your breastplate on. He starts there. The soldier would start there, and, and, and Paul starts there. And importantly, something that we've mentioned before, so I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, is how did folks in the Roman era dress? They weren't wearing jeans and, and, and slacks and that kind of thing. They were dressed in robes including the soldiers. And so when it was time for them to, to do battle or even go to work, it was important for them to not trip over themselves. And so they would take their garment and they would gird it around themselves. They would wrap it up and they would tuck it into their belt so that they could have freedom of movement. And I actually like some of the more uh, literal, if you want to say that, translations like the NASB in this case. The NIV is a great translation. I use that a lot. But the NASB is one of those more literal translations where, where it says, go ahead and pull that up. It says, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. And we don't use language like girding your loins uh, today. Uh, very often, matter of fact, if, if, if you're coming and someone says, here he comes, gird your loins, that's, that's a sign. I don't know. <laughs> you know. That means they're getting ready to do battle in some way. But girding your loins really just means to wrap it up. And so when he says gird your loins with truth, he, he really means surround yourself with truth. Be ready to do battle having started with the truth. The, the truth is the beginning point. And, and, and so that's the place that we have to begin. What did Jesus say in John chapter 14? He said, I am the truth. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. A chapter later, in, in, in chapter 15, he, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, and he calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. That's interesting. And then earlier in, in, in the same book, in chapter 8, he says, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So the truth is the beginning point. The truth matters very much. And we hear so much today things like, my truth, and your truth, or live your truth. And I, 
I got to tell you, I'm not a fan of that statement. I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not a fan of the live your truth or my truth or your truth. And, 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 and I get someone would say, well, all that really means is that you need to be honest about your, your opinions or honest about your experience or honest about your feelings. And Okay, but if that's the case, just say that. Because I think when we start trying to qualify truth in some way, we, we, we miss the point of what truth is. If that's all you mean, if you're just talking about one person's experience or perspective, those can be valid, but that, that's not the same as objective truth. If you hear me say amen, there is a, such a thing as objective or absolute or fundamental truth, things that are true and can't be changed regardless of perspective. This table is black. This material is wood. You're sitting in a chair. And if you have an opinion that says something different, well, I don't like to call this a chair. I like to call this a sitting device. It's still a chair. <laughs> so truth is truth. And more and more often today, I'm afraid that we, we're finding people be afraid to tell the truth. And I think that's a dangerous thing, especially, by, look, politics and government. Folks are afraid to tell the truth. Folks are afraid to, to answer questions. They respond to questions rather than answering a question. That's a sure sign of a politician. And it would be ridiculous and, and, and funny if it wasn't so alarming and infuriating at times. In, in business and in leadership, we have, we've always had and there will always be folks who are afraid to, to tell the truth, right? When, when someone is afraid to tell their boss the truth, you call them a yes man. And what that means is they just parrot whatever the boss says or, or, or they say whatever they think the boss wants to hear because that's going to keep them in good graces and line them up for, you know, favor, promotion, raises, those kind of things. I'm sorry to say that more and more often we see pastors and priests and ministers who have become spiritual yes men who are much more concerned about saying the things that they think people want to hear than biblical truth and they're happy to compromise on biblical truth, if it means they can accumulate more followers or influence or money. It's an evil thing. It's a dangerous thing. When it comes to doing business yourself, when it comes to being on the receiving end, you need to hire someone. The fact is, a lot of times we, we worry about being taken advantage of, don't we? You need to go get your car repaired somewhere. You need to get something fixed around your home. And, we, well, I want to make sure I, I, I find someone who is honest. I had the situation uh, not too long ago, this past month, where our garage door at home uh, broke, and it was something more than what I could handle or more than what I could, uh, could fix on my own. And so I called around and had someone come out, and he gave me a quote, and I had to pay for the quote. My bad. He, he got me on that one. Had to pay for that quote. All right? Should, the quote should have been free. So I'm getting up on my soapbox for a minute. And then, and then they quoted the price, and it was like 700 bucks to fix it. And, and I said, oh, my goodness, you know. Uh, and, and, he, and then he says, you want me to start right now? I said, no, I don't want you to start right now. I'm going to use the front door for a little bit longer until I figure this out and pray on it somewhere. No, we had a, so we had someone else. I, I knew that was too high. So we had, and, and, and by the way, and he tells me, the reason I bring this up, he says, well, this is as cheap as it's going to get, pal. This, this is the, you're not going to find anybody uh, less expensive than this. And I said, I bet you're not telling the truth there. And sure enough, someone fixed it for about half that price. Now, garage door only goes up halfway. Uh, no, 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 but, but, but we found someone fixed it and it was correct. And I, I knew that that was, was too expensive, but you know, most of, you know, if you're new here, you don't, before I entered full-time ministry years and years and years ago at this point, I served as a police officer in my hometown of Georgia. And I got to tell you, as a police officer, I learned very quickly just how prone people are to not telling the truth. That's a nice way of saying, I figured out soon that a lot of people lie. I learned to quit asking the question, do you know how fast you were going? Because apparently there's never been a person on earth who's answered that question correctly. Or, 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 or honestly, I should say. Do you know how fast you were going? Oh, yes, officer. I, I know that the speed limit is 55 miles an hour, so I was only going 54 miles per hour. I had my hands at, at 10 and 2 on the wheel. My eyes were looking straight ahead. You lie. You lie. I saw you. First off, you were going 87 miles an hour. And when you passed by, this is a real story, you had one hand on the wheel. You were 
turned around facing the other direction, doing what I can only imagine was beating one of your children <laughs> with, I guess since you're only wearing one sandal, the other one. <laughs> I'll tell you my, while we're on the subject, I'll tell you my, my favorite lie, if you want to, that's a weird thing to say. But it's, it's weird that I heard it more than once, and it's weird that I heard it more times than I can remember. And the situation would go, uh, I would be on a call or a stop or something, and, and I would have to pat someone down or, or check their pockets, and I would find an illegal substance. And you can fill in the blank on what I'm talking about when I say an illegal substance. And I would find it, and I'd be placing the person under, under arrest, and the person would say to me, and I heard this more times than I can remember, they said, oh, officer, these aren't my pants. And I remember the first, I mean, the first time that I heard that, I said, what? I said, no, these aren't my pants. And so I just remember hesitating and, you know, safety was paramount, do what you need to do. And, and so I'm coming back and said, all right, let me, let me break down the scenario that you're talking about here, if that's true. So, so to, to back up, you're at home, no pants. And then you decide, well, I'm going to head over to the Walmart or to the club or wherever you were headed to. And in this scenario, there are multiple pants, either in a pile or strewn throughout the house, and you grab one, and it just happens to be the right size in the pants pile. And it just happens to have your keys, your wallet, but somebody else's illegal substance. Yes, officer, that's exactly what happened. Get in the car. And it was moments like that where I realized I think I'll be able to do more good going into full-time ministry. So people lie sometimes. No one here, but sometimes people stretch the truth or abstain from the truth. But God values truth, doesn't he? And he calls you and I to be people of truth. And so I want to give you some application points today uh, for being a person of truth, for putting on that belt of truth. And, and at the end of this, we'll talk about how, how do I use this in my prayer time as something that engages my mind and, and, and helps me as I, you know, put on, metaphorically, you know, put on that armor of God in my prayer time and seek the Lord for his strength and his armor in a very real and spiritual way. Way. So point number one is this, a person of truth or a truthful person, number one, is honest. Yeah, a person of truth is an honest person. Proverbs chapter 12 tells you how the Lord feels. He says the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. He likes it when we're honest. And an honest person is someone who very simply just tells the truth. It's so basic. That means that they're not prone to lies. They're not prone to, to falsehood. They're also not prone to hiding things or seeing how much we can get away with. That's, that's not a picture of honesty. So sneakiness, you know, behind closed door kind of things, that's not truthful behavior. Honesty is what makes a person trustworthy. And when we're caught in a lie... Someone who's, who's proven to be dishonest through their behavior or through their, through their speech, it's very difficult to trust that person again. Trust is something that has to be earned, doesn't it? 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 6 says, Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. Parents, one of the things that if you've been a parent for long, you know that part of raising a child is, is that from time to time they're going to do things that, that are wrong. They're going to, sometimes purposefully, sometimes mistakenly. One of the rules in our household has always been, look, just be honest. Because if you do something wrong, yeah, you might get in a little trouble for it. Depends, depends on what it is. But if you lie about it, that's a whole different story. You do something, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody messes up from time to time. Tell the truth. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16 says, You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Leviticus chapter 19 puts it even more simply. Do not steal, do not lie, and do not deceive one another. So the next time you go to the doctor, and he asks you or she asks you, how many times a week 
do you exercise? Tell them the truth. <laughs> they can look at your blood tests and know. There's no reason to lie to your doctor. You're only going to hurt yourself. And, and someone came to me just before service. I'll move on from this point. And said, yeah, no, Pastor, when I was a kid... My, uh, my dad, we, he'd take us to, to Six Flags or whatever amusement park it was. And, and I know we got a some, some, uh, few families that are apparently going to Six Flags tomorrow. I wasn't invited, but it's no, more, no problem. It's fine. But he said my dad would, would take us. We, got, we had five siblings, and so he would take two of us to the gate, and we'd get the hand stamp. And then he'd take us back out to the car, and he'd make us rub our hands on our other siblings so that they could get the stamp on them too. I just want to tell you, now some of y'all are getting ideas, but I know since you're Revelation Church folks and you're people of, of truth, you're never going to do such a thing as that, but I, I had to laugh pretty hard at that. I was like, that's a pretty good idea, but, but we best not. Point number two is this, a person of truth seeks the whole truth. Somebody say the whole truth. Okay, it seeks the whole truth, and, and catch this, this is really talking about in times of disagreement. In conflict, especially with a close family member, your spouse or whatever, a person of truth wants to seek the whole truth instead of just trying to cling to or advance their own opinion. Proverbs chapter 18, fools find no pleasure in understanding but delight in airing their own opinions. And you've met them and I've met them and they don't go to church here, but there are some people that just love to hear themselves talk and they, and, and they know that they're right no matter what. They would argue with a stop sign. A truthful person seeks to know the whole truth instead of just airing out their own opinion. What, and what that means is in these times of conflict, a person puts on the belt of truth when they make the decision to say, you know what, I'm going to get outside of my own perspective. I'm going to quit clinging to this one belt loop because I can only see this side of the issue. And every, matter of fact, if, if, if you, I don't want to go too deep into this because in our marriage series just a couple of months ago, I got real deep into this. And so marriage series part three, we'll link to it uh, online, uh, but you can check that out. But we talked about this, idea, this whole idea of, of in a conflict, there's always more than one point of view. There's always more than one perspective. And, and I see a piece of it. But my field of vision is limited. And, and, and let's say if it's a disagreement between myself and my spouse, I see a piece of it, and, and, and my wife sees a piece of it. But we're limited because we're, we're just people. And one of the most humble, godly things that you can ever do is say the phrase, if I hear your heart. If you will just take a minute and, and stop clinging to this point of view but may, might be completely true, might be completely valid, but if you'll just take a second and instead of, instead of talking so much, God gave us two of these and one of these, just, just listen for the heart of your spouse to the point where you could speak their peace for them. If I hear your heart, the way that you feel about this is such and such. When we do that, it gets us outside of just our own perspective, and we're then be able to begin to see not just this point of view, not just this point of view, but God's point of view. And when married couples, a lot of times, when close relationships come to a place where the whole truth is realized, most of the time that means that conflict ceases because then we see the whole truth, excuse me, then we see the whole picture. That doesn't mean, by the way, that, that each side of an argument uh, is correct or that, you know, that every point is, is always valid. That their right is right and, and, and wrong is wrong, and there are some times that we wrong one another, and, and feeling wrong, wronged doesn't make it okay for, uh, for impure or unholy or unwholesome or, or mean-spirited actions and those kind of things. But it's a humble thing, and it's a godly thing to say, you know what, I want the whole truth, not just my own point of view, and so I'm going to make the decision to hear my spouse's or my child or my parent's heart, and then we're going to seek God for his heart together. And if you hear me, say amen. amen. When you go to court, uh, they say, and, and you, you're about to give testimony, what do they want you to do? I swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The truth is the big picture, and a lot of times it's more than just what we see. If you hear me, say yeah. 
Proverbs 18 says, The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. So God, help us to get outside of our own perspective and cling to our own point of view and listen for your heart and, and, and such an important thing. If you hear me say amen. 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 Point number three is this. This is a big one. A person of truth speaks the truth in love. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Instead of, excuse me, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Now, the context of this verse is that Paul is telling those in the Ephesian church not to believe every wind of teaching that comes along. There have been some folks that had come in and were spreading heresy and false teaching, and Paul said, nah, don't put up with that. You know the truth, so tell the truth. And, and so this is about bringing correction when necessary or correcting error. This requires wisdom. This requires discernment. Because almost anybody can state the obvious, or at least should be able to state the obvious. But this can be a real challenge for folks today. This might be something that telling the, the whole truth or telling the kind truth, speaking the truth in love, this might be something we come back to at some point in the future and devote a whole message to. But there are times when it's uncomfortable to speak the truth. Do you know that? There are times where, where, and there are multiple scenarios where it's necessary, but every time it requires wisdom. You know, one scenario might be someone comes into the the church and, and they claim to be someone who loves Jesus, but they're teaching or living in a way that is obviously contrary to the Word of God. Maybe it's a person who's who they have a face at church. But outside of church, they're, they're, they're abusive to, toward their spouse or toward their children or they're, or they're unfaithful or they're unethical in some way. Well, that might be an uncomfortable conversation, but it's a necessary one for someone to have. Maybe the pastor, maybe a, a friend. And maybe a, a more common situation is one where you know of a friend or a relative who is deep in addiction and you see that that day by day that addiction is destroying their life. That substance, whatever it may be, it's destroying them physically. It's destroying their, their relationship with their spouse. It's destroying their relationship with, with their children or, or, or with you. And there's a conversation that needs to take place where it's uncomfortable. And it needs to be addressed in the right way. But the most loving thing that you can do is to confront them about that that behavior. So speaking the truth in love is uncomfortable and it has to be addressed in the right way because you want to correct and you want to speak truth in a way that conveys the necessary intensity but causes the minimal amount of hurt or damage possible. But sometimes the truth hurts, doesn't it? And so this is not something that we would ever want to get excited about. Oh, I can't wait to just blast them. It's something that we would approach with humility and, and, and grace and then tell the truth. And if you hear me say amen. amen. Requires courage. Requires courage. And before we move on from this point, very briefly, I, I, I'm afraid that we've reached a point today where too many people are afraid to tell the truth about certain things. People are afraid to say things that they know to be true because they've been conditioned to believe that it's better to remain silent or even affirm a lie than to tell the truth that would offend. Do you hear me? Yeah. First Corinthians chapter 16, Paul tells the church there to be courageous. He says, look, have courage. You need to stand firm in the faith. But more and more often today, it takes courage just to call good things good and wrong things wrong. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you are called to have the guts to do that. You are called to call good, good, and to call evil, evil. And not to be swayed by the temptation to compromise out of fear. Fear of being labeled in some way or fear of offending. Those are the kind of things that, that have led to people refusing to say things that, that need to be said or going along with, some, with someone else's lie and saying things that we know in our heart are, are false. And it's called forced speech. And that's a dangerous, dangerous thing. If you can be coerced into saying something that you know is not true, what do you really have left? Be a person of integrity. 
Sometimes the truth is offensive. Sometimes the truth hurts. And if you hear me, say amen. amen. Last point of today. Point number four is this. A person of truth keeps their word and lives with integrity. Luke chapter 16, verse 10 Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. And so when we live as a person of truth, when we live as a person who keeps our word and and live as a person of integrity, that means if we say we're going to do something, we do it. We follow through on what we say. We finish what we start. Our word means something. And a big part of this, and here's the tough one, When we're wrong, we admit it. One of the toughest things on earth to do sometimes is just to admit when we're wrong or to apologize to someone. It can be tough, but God says live as a person of integrity. Be trusted with the little things. Be trustworthy with the little things, and let me then trust you with with the big things. Sometimes the truth can be inconvenient for, for our personal cause, and when that's the case, it doesn't stop being the truth. That means we turn the report in even if it, if it doesn't make us look good, even if the numbers don't put us in the, in the best light. Most of the time when people lie or try to mislead someone else, it's somehow out of self-preservation. It'll keep me out of trouble. It'll keep someone from, from looking down on me in some way. Look, a person of integrity will tell the truth even if it negatively affects them. That's what it means to be a truthful, honorable, honest person. And if you hear me say amen. So a person of integrity lives the same way in private as they do in public. There's no secret lifestyle. There's no double standards. That's what it means to be real. That's, that's authenticity. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9 says, Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. One of the toughest things about lies and falsehood is that they keep having to be stacked on one another. But when you tell the truth, you've got nothing to worry about because God makes straight those paths. Let's stand together. Thanks so much for watching online with us today. If right now you would like to pray and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then will you pray this very simple prayer of faith with me and mean it from your heart? Just say, Jesus, today I put my trust in you. Please forgive me for my sins be the Lord of my life and help me now to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, then I believe that you are born again in the way that the Bible says. I'm so excited for you and not just me, but scripture says that all of heaven is rejoicing right now about the decision that you just made. I hope that you'll tell us about it. Send us an email to info at revchurchsa.com. We've got some free resources that we would love to be able to send your way that are going to help you on this new walk of faith that you have begun. God bless you today, and I look forward to hearing from you very soon.